Cool, we're ready to go. Um, hey everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, today I'm going to talk about Smash Tanks, which was a game that we um, developed over the last four months of last year, um, and we released it at Christmas, just in time for the holidays. It's a multiplayer AR game. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of about how we kind of developed that game. So just a heads up, this isn't going to be kind of a technical talk. It's not going to be packed with data. It's more about our journey discovering this game, using AR kit, and some of the bits and bobs that we kind of learned along the way. Um, so, I'm Travis, Travis Ryan. I'm a game designer. I've been making games for almost 20 years now. When I'm not making games, I'm basically wandering around the Peak District uh, with small children strapped to my back. Um, a large amount of time making those games, it was big arcade titles <coughs> with the likes of Sega um, and Microsoft. So, games like Outrun 2, Sonic and Sega All Star Racing, um, and Connect Sports. These are all titles that I had a lead creative role on. Um, I left all that in 2013 um, to set up my own studio. At that time, it was getting a lot, lot harder to kind of pitch um, and make the kind of games that I like for big studios, so arcade games. And so I found a dumpling on the belief that everybody basically had an arcade in their pocket. That's where the audience was now. Um, essentially, as a studio, we're three makers. Um, I tend to work with two engineers, so myself handling design, production, um, art direction. And then I work with Brent on the left, who is a rare veteran as well. Um, he worked on Viva Piñata, he worked on um, Connect Sports and the Avatar system. And we got Jared. Um, Jared joined us on his placement year out of university, um, and he never left, really. Um, <coughs> so, our first game was Dashy Crashy. We released this in the holiday of uh, 2015. And um, we made this game because we believed that we could kind of give the endless genre a bit of a kick in the pants. Um, which I think we did. Um, we managed to kind of like supercharge it with physics, make sure that every time you played it, it was something very, very different. Um, it's a game that we still kind of develop and support from um, time to time, even now. Um, and it went on to get 5 million downloads, which um, is great. That allowed us to stay fully independent um, as a studio and kind of experiment with some new titles. So let's get on to Pitch Car. Um, not Pitch Car, I didn't make Pitch Car. Let's go on to Smash Tanks. So the inspiration for Smash Tanks kind of really came from my son and playing games with my son. Uh, in fact, he'll probably tell you that he came up with the idea for this. Um, so me and him, we kind of love playing board games together, especially those sort of tactile games where you're kind of flicking things around at each other. Um, and it was during these sorts of sessions that we kind of hit upon, I kind of wondered if we could kind of recreate that family time where we were kind of getting together and it's a little more social as a game. So we actually started thinking about developing a digital board game. That's where we kind of started from. Pitch Car was a huge inspiration for us at that time. It's still a game that we play today. You build a track, you flick cars around. Um, and so Prototype 1, we literally just tried to remake Pitch Car. Um, so we replaced the flick mechanic with a simple sort of slingshot mechanic. Um, and you basically had to sort of rebound your way around the board. Um, it was rubbish, basically. We spent a day making this. And when you're making a racing game, you're trying to make something that's got really good kind of flow to it. Um, and this was just too stop start it didn't, it didn't really work out very well. <coughs> but what was actually kind of cool about this was the slingshot mechanic. The actual kind of pulling back and flinging things around, physical objects, felt really cool. So with that idea, we kind of took one of the tanks, which was our most popular vehicle in Dashy Crashy, and we just kind of like popped it together with another tank and just smashed tanks against each other. Um, and this instantly felt fun. This is pretty much version one of Smash Tanks. We would give this to kids, and they would sit there and they would basically just have fun kind of smashing tanks into each other. They'd be hitting off the sidewalls. There was these possibilities of trick shots. Um, so this kind of felt like we had something. We had something that kind of people could kind of pick up and just have instant sort of fun with. There's no game here at this point, but people were having fun with it nonetheless. So we decided that we were going to take this um, further and kind of flesh it out as a game as well, kind of get some basic rules in there. So here's the next kind of prototype version. We spent a few more days kind of establishing the rules of the game. So anyone who's played Smash Tanks, this will be very, very familiar to you. The actual format of the game, three tanks, turn-taking, energy bars, destructibles, these are all elements that were there right from the start of the game. <coughs> um, and we tend to do this quite a lot at Dumpling. We kind of hit on the formula straight away, and then we spend a long time kind of doing the what-ifs and kind of exploring all the different possibilities with it. Um, but again, up until this point, the game has remained a fixed top-down viewpoint. It's very, very easy to play. Everyone can just pick it up and kind of get in there. That's cool. But it was as we were sort of developing the weapons for this game that little screenshots and GIFs like this started to emerge, and we'd sort of send them to each other. And all of a sudden, the game looks really cool. It looks a lot more dynamic and exciting. Um, so we actually 
sort of talked about and started tinkering with the possibility of how can we kind of make our game seem more dynamic as in these shots. Um, we experimented with a couple of things. So the first one, we looked at the idea of basically cutaways. So at key moments, basically the camera would cut away to the action. Um, that was too confusing. It basically, what would happen is it's a turn-taking game and then it's cutting away and people just lose track of what's going on. Um, the second thing we tried was actually to kind of get the camera in a lot, lot closer and, and basically give the player some sort of control of positioning the camera and moving that camera around. And, um, and what we found with that is it just added friction. Well, we'd gone from a very, very simple kind of input to something that actually kind of felt more complicated to play. Um, so we're at a weird point with this project at this point. We kind of had something where the core mechanic was very fun to play. As a game, it was extensible in terms of what we had as a system, which I'll talk about later. But it kind of lacked something. It lacked a pop. It lacked something that really made it kind of stand out. So we just kind of shelved this. We'd only been working on it a couple of weeks. Um, and we just popped it on the shelf again. That happens with a lot of dumpling projects. We put them on a the shelf. See, so basically, if they if there's use for them later. <coughs> but then around um, June last year, when Apple had their WWDC talk, they unveiled ARKit. And then suddenly the light bulb went off. And it pretty much looked exactly like this. The first thought that kind of came to our minds was like, Star Wars Hollow Chess. It's like, now we can actually have these things on a table in front of us and supported by the fact that actually we were building a kind of board game. We had that prototype in the background. So it's a bit of a perfect storm. Um, but that's kind of, that was literally our initial um, inspiration for kind of tinkering with the AR kit um, to start with. <coughs> so we actually wouldn't get to tinker with this um, for some weeks later, until um, August time. We were in the middle of doing arcade season for Dashy Crashy. Um, but sometime in August, it was probably about mid-August, Jared downloaded the latest AR kit plugin. Uh, from the Unity store, and literally over the course of the morning, we went from this 2D top-down board game to chasing life-size tanks down corridors. Because um, <coughs> obviously the first thing that you do whenever you're making anything um, in AR, you just make it massive. Um, but it's important to emphasize that we weren't making AR games before this. We hadn't even considered making AR games before this. Um, but literally over the course of that day, we managed to grab the tool set, plug it in to our existing prototype, and we were up and running. Um, we don't really know anything about surface detection, anchoring, light matching, all that sort of stuff. So like, that's just out of the realms of three guys to solve as a problem. But actually what ARKit allowed us to do, certainly with the Unity plugin, is just literally um, kind of get up and running with our prototypes very, very quickly. <coughs> so actually, once we kind of settled the game down, and brought it down to more of a board game sort of scale, <coughs> what we kind of found is Players were very naturally exploring the board. They're the camera now. Suddenly, they're actually kind of moving around that board. They're kind of positioning, framing the action, getting a closer look at things. And what this kind of did is those camera problems that we kind of had previously, they're just kind of solved straight away. Suddenly, the game looked dynamic now. Um, it looked more exciting to play. The other thing is we were in the middle of um, making a big social fighting game at the time. We'd spent a lot of time and energy doing that. But seeing this, it was literally a holy shit moment for the team. The three of us are all looking at this, and it's like, we haven't really seen this before. We've got this game in front of us. It's working. We can see the possibilities with it. Um, so we literally stopped what we were developing on everything else and just decided to concentrate on ARKit <coughs> um, and this title in particular. So over the next few weeks, we would basically bang together a play test with the aim of kind of getting it out there, getting public to kind of feed back on it um, and seeing what they thought. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of cover the kind of key discoveries that we kind of hit upon during this early phase, which sort of set the tone of the project. <coughs> so the first one is the sort of balance between digital and real. Um, the previous sort of prototype that you saw, the board, was solid. And what that kind of does is it kind of obscures the environment a little bit. It kind of feels like you've stuck something on. And um, what we kind of found very, very quickly is that as soon as we removed that board, it suddenly felt like you were placing objects onto a surface. It suddenly felt more physical and more tactile. Um, and this is something that we kind of discovered um, with the effects and the things that you can do as well. Suddenly, you can scar the environment. You can chunk things out of the world. You can put decals on there for explosions. It kind of makes it feel more real. Um, and that was a very early sort of discovery that we had, but it, it definitely kind of set the tone for what we would do later. <coughs> Second thing is input. Now that basically players are that uh, camera, they're going to move that device every which way. They're going to go portrait, they're going to go landscape, they're going to move it on the fly. So obviously we had to support 
basically a UI that fully kind of supported that, allowed them to play the game however they want it. You can't, you can't tell people to rigidly use a camera in a specific way, certainly kids. But actually this led to pro pretty much one of our biggest kind of discoveries in terms of input. And that was that up until this point we've been using screen space um, input that was relative to screen space basically. But what it means is as soon as people start moving that device, the input starts to feel a little bit off. Actually when you switch it to AR space, it just kind of works. It sounds obvious, but a lot of devs don't do this. But it, it means that gives us a very, very simple control method where players basically just kind of swipe as in real space and it, it kind of just works. Uh, but that was a big thing for us. Uh, UI is another one. I think everybody goes through this, but the first thing that you think is, right, okay, AR, we've got a game on a table, I'm going to put 3D elements everywhere, the UI is going to be in the world and all that stuff, and uh, no one looks at it, which is not good. Um, so we'd have things like turn-taking, we'd have scores kind of in the world, and it just, nobody would register with it. So actually what we needed to do is bring key information into a more traditional UI um, format. But actually what happens there is that suddenly it obstructs the view. When you play an AR game, you're so involved with the camera, you're looking around, that when you kind of put any sort of panelling on there, it becomes really obvious that that's happening. So the solution really was to just, just to crib Apple's translucency um, that they use on all their UI and just kind of put it on all our UI as well. Uh, and then what that allows to do is you've kind of got these nice clear panels, but you've also got kind of world bleeding in and it kind of softens it all and makes the UI kind of work a lot better. So this is a hot topic in AR at the moment, and it was a hot topic for us back then. Um, but we decided very, very early on that we were going to make all our AR games multiplayer. <coughs> and obviously there's the issue of shared AR space. Um, and we were going to have a crack at that, or try and bring in some third-party solution. But what we discovered is, certainly with the format of our game, you would hand two devices to two people, and they'd just face off. They would just naturally assume this position. Um, and we saw this time and time again with playtests. And what this meant is that those two players just kind of naturally facing off and creating this invisible space between them. It meant that we didn't have to worry about syncing. Players kind of did that for us. Um, so it won't work for every game, but it certainly worked for this game. Um, so that was a huge headache. We could, we could literally not think about shared AR space, which was wins for us. <coughs> so we've been devving for a few weeks now. We've got what we think is a, a good, solid... Um, prototype, we're going to play test it. So we decided to get some space last minute at EGX. So for those who don't know, EGX is the biggest game conference in the UK. It's hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it's all the big boys there. It's all console games. So anybody who's demoed a mobile game at a show like this, you'll know how hard that is. So imagine how difficult it is to demo an invisible game on an empty table. Um, <coughs> so our um, ideal approach is something like this. So you've got a dedicated space, you've got good surface detail, you've got great lighting. Um, and importantly, we always output to a screen so people can see what's happening. So it's like an attract mode in an arcade. Um, unfortunately, day one looked a lot like this. Um, somebody stole our table, the cloth wouldn't pick up the tech, the light in wouldn't work. Um, and actually, crucially, we were demoing a multiplayer game. And um, due to the sheer volume of signal noise uh, at the event center, we couldn't, we couldn't get the games to work. So actually, day one of EGX looked a lot like this. Um, me and Brent are kind of holed up in a coffee shop in the corner, trying to figure solutions out. And the solution was just to kind of bin the multiplayer off and develop a very rudimentary AI. And actually, that worked out really well for us, because it meant that we kind of had even more people kind of playing the game and testing the game. So end of day one, everyone's gone home, but we've, we've cracked it. And we're all up and running. We've got our table. Um, everything's good. Um, so the rest of AR, uh, the rest of AR, the rest of EGX kind of looked like this. We had people picking up the game. The core mechanics of the game were easily understood. Everybody were picking it up and playing it, but nobody was moving. Nobody was using AR as we kind of intended it. And we kind of thought about why this was. And at the time, a lot of AR games were almost like these demos focused on a singular thing. So it was like an item that you were moving around. And in a weird way, we wondered if because we were a game first, if the game actually kind of obscured the technology in some way. So we spent some time trying to solve this on the show floor. We do this at all our events. We're always devving at the events, and that's really why we do them, to get feedback and iterate. Um, so the first solution was to put a really great big tower in the middle of the map and completely obscure the player's view. And for anyone who's seen video game lean, when you're playing a driving game, people leaning around corners and stuff like that, what we kind of had here was as soon as we put this object and this map appeared, is people would just naturally lean. They would naturally just kind of look around. And then they'd be hit by this moment of, oh, wow, 
like this is this is this is something I've not seen before. And then they would start exploring the board and moving around. Um, so this was super effective and actually set the tone of our map design, kind of going forward, established verticality that we wanted to obscure the player's viewpoints um, quite often. The second thing that we kind of looked at is how to get players moving around that table um, and actually kind of exploring the board a little bit more. So we introduced weak spots. And the idea here was basically that at the back of each tank, you'd have a little weak spot, and if you hit it, you get quad damage. <coughs> and what this did is, all of a sudden, people were actually using the border and the environment to actually kind of place their shots. They were suddenly trying to do these rebound shots um, around the board. And that was great. If, if you were just looking outside in, you'd almost be convinced they were playing a pool game, the way that they would view the table and maneuver around it. Um, the second thing is this really increased the pace of the game. Suddenly the game became very, very fast-paced. People were hitting these weak spots. And so that established the rules for us as well, things like best two out of three and things like that. So we've got really happy players now. The next three days kind of uh, awesome. We've got people bringing their friends back. We've got people coming back towards the end of the day to try and get some Wi-Fi games in, which we were able to do because it was a bit quieter. We had people making up drinking games, which I can't endorse. Um, and it was awesome. It was great feedback. And then this popped up. So The Guardian, which is a pretty big publication in the UK, they picked us one of their 12 fave games at the show. And again, we're a prototype at this point. We didn't go out there to publicize. We went to get feedback. So then picking us kind of gave us a really good spotlight, and people kind of got behind the game. Um, and it also turns out that Apple were at EGX as well. And um, we got an invite from Apple to actually come and demo the game down in London and spend a couple of days with Tim Cook demoing AR game. So we were only one of three games there. We were the only multiplayer game there. <coughs> so at this point, this is crazy. We'd only been working on this prototype for a few weeks. In fact, the Sunday before the Monday demoing, we rewrote all the multiplayer because it wasn't working properly. So classic. Uh, it all worked out, and it was great seeing press and um, Apple kind of playing it in multiplayer. So that was ace. So we're kind of in mid-October now. Team are feeling really good. We've got really good momentum behind the project. It's a new technology that we just seem to be kind of getting on with. Everything seems to be clicking with it. And it kind of feels like there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is this is a Christmas game. This is a holiday game. Um, I think this is pretty much the image we all had in our head. But instead of the board game, it's all expensive Apple devices. Um, and so we set our date of December 21st. And we were going to run it that date and get this out um, for the holiday period. So the next 10 weeks look a lot like this. Testing, testing, testing. Like endless street testing. Me and Jared would go out and test in, in malls, in department stores, on streets. And it was less about the game mechanics. It was more about the robustness of the technology and what we needed to do to try and kind of help it along. Um, we also basically we had students in from local um, universities and colleges. Um, they were with us literally in teams of two for a couple of weeks at a time. And they were giving us relentless feedback from a gamer's perspective. Um, so there was a group of us all kind of really kind of trying to channel this game. Um, we also did two more shows. Um, so we did Play Expo, which is a big show in Manchester in England. And we used this show to basically develop Pass and Play, which um, as a mode is basically you just have one device and can pass it around. We kind of didn't go into that event with that mode, but we came out of the event with it, which is cool. Um, and we also did an event called Yorkshire Game Fest, which is a very young audience. And if you want to stress test your game and really stress out your engineers, that is the perfect show to do it. Um, but again, constantly getting feedback and constantly iterating on it. So over the next um, few weeks as well, there were kind of three big, big sort of issues that we worked on. These are what kind of absorbed all our time. Um, the first one was demolition. So again, we really wanted to encourage the player's exploration of the board and how they kind of would move around and make sure that it was fresh every single time that they played it. And the solution for this was really to have these destructible components, which varied every time you played. It's all physics driven. Um, so every time you play even the same map, it's going to end up different based on the actions and the weapons and all those things that kind of um, play. Also, as an AR tip, there is nothing cooler than destruction. When things fall and fly past the camera and you kind of track it, all that stuff uh, is super, super cool. Um, <coughs> So the next thing, and this, as this literally went throughout the whole project. And hands up, this was a mechanic. Usually, if your mechanics aren't working, drop them. But this was a mechanic I was really trying to get to work. And it's what we call the pick three system. And up until this point, all through the events, players had utilized this system. And the idea was that basically, the players would have a collection of tanks. They'd all be very different. They'd have different abilities um, and supports. And then the player would literally just pick three at the start. 
and then go into battle. And what this did is it provided all these different configurations, players that have different builds. I had a very aggressive build that was all missiles, and Brent would have a very Healy build, which was all kind of support-based. Um, and we loved this system, and it worked, it worked great. Up until they got into the game, and then people couldn't work out what was happening with it. They didn't know how their weapons were charging, they didn't know how to trigger them, we had all these different components, we tried putting buttons in, all these things just added uh, complexity to the game. And um, like we, I really tried to label uh, labour this uh, one, but it just it just didn't work. So literally two weeks before we launched the game, we was just talking about Mario Kart. It. Um, so the idea behind that is we had all these weapons, we developed all these weapons, we put them in um, dynamic crate drops, and then based on actually what was happening in the match itself, it distribute different items. This solved so many problems for us. Everybody instantly understood what was happening. Crates were coming in, they know they've got to get the crates, you know that it's a random because of the question mark. Um, it kind of felt fair in terms of the balance based on what the number of tanks were. People just got this system straight away. They even just would try and tap the tanks to trigger the weapons straight away. So everything kind of, it, it fixed tons of problems for us. Um, but it also gave us our biggest problem. Um, and up until this point, our game was completely, it was going to be free. And we were going to basically sell um, packs of tanks um, and also incentivize people with ads and things like that. We just got rid of that. And so with two weeks to launch, trying to explore what our monetization options are for this game, um, we were in a bit of a panic, to be honest. Um, we explored ads for this, but actually we just didn't think it was a very good fit um, for what we were doing. Um, certainly when... Our game wasn't a game which was played in snacks. It wasn't a game that you kind of would have a little go at every day. It was a game where you got together with your friends and played it as a board game. It was an event game. So we kind of felt it was harder to kind of use the standard sort of free-to-play gimmicks in this sense. There's also another point at the moment about the current state of ads in AR. They're very, very obstructive. There's nothing, like the moment when you're playing an AR game, you're so immersed in moving that camera around and moving around the environment that when an ad pops up, it really jars. And the majority of games that we kind of play and that happens, it's like, we don't want to play it anymore. So that really wasn't an option for us. So the only option left really was premium. Um, and we sort of talked a lot about what the value of this game would be. And we kind of settled on actually the sort of the, the driver for it was really what's the value and what's the cost of two people getting together and playing this game. And so we sort of settled at 399, which then landed us at 199. So it let people kind of, um, their friends kind of easily get access to it. It's also family sharing supported. So if you're just one family and you want to play it on all your devices, that works as well. So December, t this is literally December 20th. We submitted on the night before. Um, so we're finished. Everything's done. We actually, I think this is the first time Dumplings actually hit a date. So go us. Uh, but we're not finished. Um, so the game is on the store now, it's December 21st, and we don't have a preview video, which is number one no-no. We'd spent so long just trying to get this game together and get it out that we hadn't had time to actually kind of do any of the, any of the store stuff that you usually spend a month kind of trying to do. So we kind of hold it down to the local cafe, um, there's me, Jared and Brent, and spent the afternoon kind of trying to film and put together this trailer. I had an awesome idea how it would fit, it was very infomercially. Um, sat taking all these different shots and cuts and fake smiles and all that stuff, and it didn't work. It wasn't working. It just didn't didn't feel good. Couldn't f feel how to put it together. Um, it's like 5:30 now. The place is closing down, and we are literally running out of time. Um, and then the suggestion is, let's just film a match. So actually, this is just a very honest kind of look at actually what the game is. There's no cuts. It's all in single cut. We we filmed kind of one whole game, and that kind of came out of it. We're very lucky with that. Um, the actual way this is done is I would position Jared and Brent at a table. It was me playing the game, recording. I placed the game between them, and I was given direction. I was like, right, Jared, you fired missiles, and Brent, you've launched a nuke. And they were doing fake reactions. So, um, But that's actually how we kind of filmed it and we think that was one of the best kind of approaches. We were kind of really happy with that. It felt like it was a really honest take on what we were making, even though we kind of cheated. Um, just for fun, we uploaded this to Reddit, just to see. Um, and it ended up getting almost 50,000 upvotes. Uh, 
really, really positive feedback and support from um, the Reddit community, which for a mobile game is kind of unheard of. Um, that went on and got a little bit of a viral blip as well. It started appearing on more mass sites like Unilad, Lad Bible, things like that, um, which was awesome. And then that resulted, well, it didn't result, but it all kind of came together and we ended up getting a worldwide feature with Apple, which was great. Um, and that would last us over the Christmas period. The, um, the actual Smash Tanks banner, kind of, I think that came in on Boxing Day. And the result of all this um, was that we ended up being number one board game over Christmas, um, which was great if you think about where we started, trying to make board games. Um, I know it sounds all perfect and crafted, but no, it isn't. That's genuinely where we landed. Um, so that was December. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of months after launch. So just as a heads up, our development cost at this point was just under £50,000, which is $65,000. That's a team of three people working on it and then with various outsourced parties and stuff like that. Um, then the key numbers to kind of look at here over the holiday period is obviously product page, um, views and the app units um, and that conversion rate, which was quite worrying for us. Um, so did the game tank? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't... I think it's too early to sort of say. Um, but actually, I think what we kind of, what we did with that conversion rate and looking at that, it was kind of like, right, okay, what can we improve on? What mistakes have we made? How can we make things kind of better? So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly rough, uh, rifle through these sort of four areas that we sort of touched on. So I don't have the original screens, but our original App Store optimization was terrible. Um, we had really rubbish screenshots, again, and we were just grabbing stuff as we could. There were four screenshots, all of my son in a library, which, as cute as it was, did not sell the game or its potential. These are the screens that we ended up updating to, so obviously we're showing different areas of the game, uh, different features, and the scope of its modes. At that point as well, we hadn't localized. Um, again, we just got it out, but pushed it worldwide. So obviously localization is massively important at the best of times. So imagine it with a new technology where people are looking at this page. They have no idea what's going on. They're just seeing all this stuff. So we quickly localized that as well, managed to kind of um, annotate our screenshots. And we put it in 13 languages in the end. There are still issues with this um, that we're still sort of trying to work through. One is our app icon. Um, that app icon is really bold and pops, which is great. But it does nothing to tell you about the game. Um, what it is, its tone, or anything like that. We've tried a few different alternatives, and it just looks really derivative. So we're still sort of playing with that and trying to find what a solution might be. Um, the other one is the commercial, um, the actual ad. As much as I kind of like it and it's honest portrayal, um, I think we're so early in AR that we kind of need to do a bit of an infomercial job with it. Um, so we're actually looking at doing another trailer which kind of steps people through the process of this is AR, this is how you play, this is where you play with your friends. Um, but that's ongoing. So the other thing, and this was, this was literally our first reaction looking at that conversion rate. It's like, is fragmentation the issue? Obviously, when you're making an AR game, you're playing to a subset of users. Um, granted, it's a 400 million subset, but it's still, anecdotally, we had a lot of friends and family who would go to check out the game, and they couldn't, they couldn't play it. They couldn't download it. <coughs> so our instant reaction to this was to prototype um, a non-AR mode, an AR off mode. And it kind of played fine, it kind of worked, but actually it kind of still felt like we had the same issues that we had before. It's, um, it's fine, it's serviceable, but it kind of lacks pop. Um, this actually works with, uh, everyone can play this mode, so you can basically have kind of like AR versus non-AR, but we haven't released it yet, and in part, there was part of that for us, it was the message of AR. It kind of felt like it's a really negative thing to kind of just release an AR game and then suddenly roll back and release a non-AR mode. But this is something that we get requested um, quite a lot, um, so it might pop up on a later version. Um, but was fragmentation the kind of real issue behind that conversion rate? Um, in the end, I think the answer actually is premium. Um, we charted top 10 in the US and in Europe. Um, so top 10, at that period of time, you're looking at that going, oh, wow, this is, this is good placement. Um, but the numbers that came through kind of don't, don't reflect that. So is that just the state of what premium is these days? Um, and for us, we started to think about, actually, is that exacerbated because it's a new technology? Not only are you trying to get people to make that jump to pay 199 but they're also having to jump into a technology that they don't really have a, a, a feel for. So I think the solution ultimately is that we're going to have to present some sort of free trial. I think we need to let people get in, try the technology. We're confident that the game is fun. We have nothing but great feedback from it. So once they've actually got in there and they've played their friends, then we can upsell them. So we let them have a few matches. Um, 
And on the back of that as well, we're also increasing the value. So we've added things, we've actually added like things like a tutorial mode, which again, we didn't have time to at launch, but also things like medal systems, ranking systems. We have weekly modes now, which um, re-spin the content of the game, so it's different every week, and friends can get together at weekend. And we're also looking at expansions. Um, so actually, this is an early prototype of our first one, so we're going to add aliens in, and all the weapons are going to be different, and you can pick your own factions. But I think the big issue, or the big challenge with AR at the moment is absolutely audience. Uh, it's so early in this technology that most people still don't know what AR is. Um, as a technology, I think a lot of people think that AR is Pokemon. And that's, that's, that's augmented reality in a, in a locational sense, but in a camera sense, I think there's still, there's still a challenge of trying to communicate what that is. When I think back to new technologies, new forms of play, like on the Wii or with Kinect, there was always a grounding, um, sort of grounding bit of software that came with it, something that you understood that then solved the technology, so something like sports or Kinect Sports or Wii Sports. And, but it was also always pushed with this big drive from platform, really selling what AR is and how people can enjoy it and how it benefits them. So I think there's all that stuff still to come. Um, the other thing that we noticed is press were very, very slow to pick up um, on Smash Tanks, and they continue to be slow on Smash Tanks. Um, and maybe we just got lost in the Christmas rush, but it feels like it's very different than when we did Dashy Crashy and we got the response for that straight away in the same period. So it feels like we're having to work a lot harder to kind of get pressed to pick up on what we're doing. Um, that's just what I'd pull out as another challenge. Um, so just before I show what else we're working on, I kind of wanted to touch about why I'm still making AR games. So we're, we are continuing to make AR games. We're planning to release two new titles this year in AR. Um, and for me, the real driving factor, of course, there's the opportunity and it's a pioneering technology, but it really is this kind of, a, it's a, such a social shared magic that you have. Whether it's our games that kind of pull friends together, whether it's friends discovering kind of like locational GOR, or whether it's like families getting together at weekends and hunting Pokemon, it's like, as a, as a bit of technology, it's, a, it's incredibly kind of inviting, and not just kind of gamers, it's friends and family. and. So I, I'm really inspired by that, and that's one of the main driving factors why I do it. As a developer, as a tiny developer of three, where basically it's a very focused challenge as well. If you actually kind of look at Smash Tanks, there's not a lot of assets in Smash Tanks. There's a lot of problems to solve, but it really allows you to kind of get in there and kind of like experiment and get right into the details of a mechanic. So even just looking at the tank, the way it pulls back, the way things kind of animate, the feedback of it, the little characters, the shine of the material, it, Usually all these things are kind of like take a lot of time, but we can iterate very, very quickly on it. Um, and then obviously there's the opportunity. Um, at this stage, we kind of get to learn by playing. Um, the technology, again, is so kind of um, new. Like We're going to get to a stage where it's so ubiquitous in what it touches, how we get entertained, how we kind of learn, and how education works. Um, that I, I, I think there's a long way to kind of go before we get there, but at this stage as a developer, we're kind of in that fun, playful, um, sort of state with it. Um, and also as well, when you're releasing your games on ARKit, they're only kind of going to get better. Like as we've already seen, Apple are absolutely kind of behind this. They're driving AR as a technology. And when we put our games out, like Smash Tanks has already got better on 1.5. We've got increased resolution, performance is better. We've now got vertical planes for more possibilities. Um, so it kind of feels like as the tech improves, so do your games or our games. <coughs> but I think there's a few things that we need to kind of crack first before it becomes this big ubiquitous um, technology. I'm not going to kind of get into wearables and stuff at this stage. I'm just going to talk more about the experience. But at the moment, there's a lot of friction with AR. When you kind of get in there, the actual sort of scanning and setting up is something that a lot of people aren't going to kind of get involved with, and it kind of puts a lot of people off. So as soon as we crack that barrier where it's more of an instant kind of feedback loop, I think that'll be, that'll be where things really start to kind of accelerate. Um, Actual shared point data is another one. Um, there's lots of different solutions kind of going around, but at the moment, the resolution, to try and really sort of tie it down, is a little bit kind of off. And uh, there's lots of third-party solutions for this, and Google have just announced a solution. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot more work to be done um, on that area. And we're actually trying something as well, which you might see in our next game. Then the other thing is actually kind of like object detection, occlusion, collision, all that sort of stuff. At the moment, AR kind of breaks as soon as something obstructs it. We need to know that there are objects. We need to, that to feed back into the game. And then ultimately, we're going to get to a point where we've got object recognition. We know that's a chair, that that's a person, that that's a cup. Um, and this is all down the line, but as soon as all this sort of technology kind of comes in, I think it'll be, um, I think it'll really accelerate things forwards. 
So at the moment, I kind of feel like this is where we are in AR. And it's like it's been the first to dance and trying to convince everybody to dance with you, whether it's developers, whether it's audience. Um, but it's a fun sort of challenging um, bit of technology. Uh, just as a heads up where we are, um, I didn't include this slide, but um, in terms of where we are now, we're at about 40,000 downloads. So it's ticking along. Um, the game is generating revenue for us. It's not buying us Ferraris or anything, but it's allowing us to carry on experimenting with that and also kind of keep experimenting with other new things. So just to close out, when we're looking at kind of what our second AR game is, <coughs> if we look back to this racing game that was rubbish and didn't work, we've kind of been tinkering with this. So our next project is basically, it's a fun multiplayer scale electrics that basically one player can kind of sit down, they kind of like drop their track down, other players can instantly join. This is using shared locational data. It supports up to four players at the moment. We're going to kind of push it to eight. Um, and it's all about, it's, it's more of a hobby game. People collect their cars, tune their cars, and then literally just race. The big thing for us is that a lot of kind of racing games, it's, they're this track placed on the world. It's really important that we nail this and that tracks actually invite the world, use the world. So you could go off track, um, things, the actual surfaces will have an effect. And we've got some surprises coming with this as well. So we're very, very early on this. This one's actually progressing a lot quicker than Smash Tanks. We're familiar with the technology. But we'll be releasing this this summer. Um, and that's it. Thank you. So I think we've got some time for questions. Or not. Hello. Uh, are you going all in on AR or are you still developing uh, 2D traditional mobile games? Um, so we're still doing some work on, Smash, on Dashy Crashy. We're doing a V3. Um, we need to change that format. People are still playing that game. People are still downloading it. Um, and people are still asking us for new cars. We kind of have a backlog of all these vehicles that we want to play with, but we haven't had a chance to kind of get those out. So I think we're aiming to do a V3 on that in the summer. It will become more self-sustainable. But in terms of new projects, we're all in on AR this year. And kind of we want to treat this almost like as our experimentational kind of year, uh, just kind of play around, see what we can do, really try and push the technology. Whether that's a good business decision or not. <laughs> hey, uh, this game looks really great, so thank you On for the app store now, lecture. 199. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask um, about the battery life, uh, because uh, I believe this is kind of a problem in AR. I don't know how uh, works with uh, Apple I develop on the other platform what is uh, sorry what was uh, what what is the issue the issue is uh, that you're using the same device that basically you use every day yep. uh, for every different battery life things. yeah battery life. yeah okay so yeah. so do you consider it uh, when designing and uh, how do you um, like uh, design a, a game time and do you, uh, do it around the battery got life you or? got you um, the simple answer is no, we just sort of design the game and try and make the technology work. But actually, uh, currently the game's sitting on a 4-4 rating worldwide, and one of our number one concerns, certainly in China, is the heat of the device and the battery drain on it. Um, that's pretty much our chief. We had some, we had some issues with um, scanning initially, which we resolved, but our chief issue at the moment is battery life and scanning, uh, is battery life and heat. Um, AR at the moment is so performant. Like you're running your camera, you're running the game, you're running the AR top tech on top of it. So I'm kind of naively hoping that Apple kind of fix that and improve that, but there's not tons that we could do with it, certainly when we want something that's got lots of physics on it. And we kind of consider our play sessions quite short, so we're quite fortunate. We don't, we don't think people sit there for like an hour, two hours playing AR games. We think they sit there over a cup of coffee uh, for 20 minutes, like having a few matches, deciding something. So uh, we, yeah, we would sit there and burn our hands. <laughs> no, it, we, we would sit there and run all the different things and see what was actually hitting performance. And obviously the game is hitting certain things because it's physics and all that sort of stuff. But it, it's, it's something that will improve over time, absolutely. I think we're in such early iterations of it. Anything else? Cool. Thank you. All right, no worries. Thank you.